first speaker for this afternoon is really awesome. Uh, he is Alan Wurz Brock. He is the editor of the ES6 slash ES2015, however you prefer to pronounce it, uh, spec. And uh, he's going to come here and talk to us about why ES6 took until ES2015. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alan Wurz Brock to the stage. Hi. Well, um, so I guess uh, you've uh, probably all heard by now, at least those of you who do JavaScript, that there is this new thing in, sa in town called either ECMAScript 2015, which we call it that because it says 2015 up there, or sometimes it's called ES or ECMAScript 6, which is because there is a number 6 up there that says 6th edition. So I I'm going to tell you about what goes into creating basically a, a major uh, web standard like this and why it takes so long. So, uh, so probably the first thing we should you know, cover here since there continues to be confusion about this is what is ECMAScript? Um, and I hear various things from various people. They, you know, some people think ECMAScript is some sort of uber language that JavaScript is some sort of subset of, but there are other languages that are also versions of ECMAScript, and uh, that's all just wrong. Uh, uh, ECMAScript is simply the name of the standard for JavaScript. Uh, and, and it has that name because of 20-year-old trademark issues and stuff, but when, when people say ECMAScript, or they really mean JavaScript. It's the same thing. Uh, and in particular, uh, the various browsers and other implementations of JavaScript, those are all engines that implement the same language that's defined as ECMAScript. So you can think of the ECMAScript being the spec that says, here is what, here's what it means to correctly implement JavaScript. Um, so uh, the ECMAScript standard is created by an international standards organization called ECMA International. That's kind of where the ECMA and ECMAScript comes from. Uh, and, and in particular, there is, ECMA gen creates many different standards for many different technologies, so JavaScript is just one of them, but it's divided into technical committees that work on, in different areas. And so JavaScript, or ECMAScript is the domain of technical committee number 39, uh, or TC39. Standards groups love to assign numbers to things for some reason and stuff. Um, and the, uh, the ECMA standard itself is officially, no one says up here, oh, let's see, you don't, can't see it so well, but it's officially known as ECMA 262. That's the standards name for the document. It's its serial number, if you will, to uni uniquely identify it. So one thing that's um, probably, uh, you might be surprised at is that uh, ECMA, ECMA International, TC39, this is totally unrelated to the W3C. And the process of creating the ECMAScript standard is totally disjoint from w W3C. If uh, so, so, so it's two major web, if you look at HTML5 and ECMAScript, you have two major web standards and they're created by different organizations. Um, which is kind of weird, but it's, it's, the, it's the way the world is. Uh, so, let's, I want to kind of go back and explain kind of how that started and how we worked up to where we are today with the ECMAScript standard. The, um, so the creation myth of JavaScript was that, uh, it was that JavaScript was created in 10 days in May of uh, 1995 by, uh, by Brendan Eich. So that was 20 years ago this year. Uh, and um, over the course of the next year, uh, it went through a couple names. It was first Mocha, and then it was called LiveScript. But by the end of uh, 1995, it was shipping in, in Netscape uh, and called JavaScript. 
And within the next year, it had been cloned by uh, Microsoft within Internet Explorer, where it was called JScript. And as is generally the case with programming languages, once you get two, two distinct implementations uh, that are done kind of independently, um, then you get issues of interoperability between them, and somebody stands up and says, we need a standard. Okay, and so that was how the process of standardizing JavaScript got started. It started in, in 1996. Uh, ECMA was chosen somehow as the venue for doing this. Um, and TC39 was formed as the technical committee to work on it. Uh, and within about a year, the, f the standard for the first edition of JavaScript was done, and that was called um, ECMAScript 1. So over the next two years, there was a minor update that was called uh, uh, ECMAScript 2, and then in 1999, the end of 1999, was released what was known as ECMAScript 3, the third edition of the ECMAScript standard. And ECMAScript 3 basically defined the foundation of the JavaScript we have been using for the last 15 years. Um, so, uh, so, so, that was where we were at the beginning of this millennia. We had just finished ECMAScript 3. And uh, then ECMAScript kind of went into its troubled adolescence phase. Uh, you know, ECMAScript, JavaScript was originally developed to do really simple scripting within browsers. Uh, simple DOM manipulations, actually DOM was in, was kind of invented simultaneously with the first, first version of, of, of JavaScript, uh, and simple validation and click handling and stuff was what it was designed for. So it was a very simple language. Uh, but by the time ES3 was done, uh, people were starting to think how to make this a, a more general purpose, a broader, a stronger language. And work started right away on what people started to call ES4. It was saying, how do we take this simple scripting language and how do we make it into a powerful general purpose language? But the problem was at that time, in 2000, 2001, nobody was actually doing any of that stuff on the web, right? They were just using these really simple forms of JavaScript and stuff. So there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm to go into that ongoing work to kind of turn JavaScript into a real programming language, if you will. And, and plus, the, at, at that time, the industry was, the, the browser world was in kind of turmoil. Uh, uh, IE was going in the, into prominence. Uh, Netscape was disappearing into AOL. And so work basically stopped on ES4 on that first version of ES4 that was done. Um, and instead, a couple years later, a bunch of the NTC39 in the ECMAScript world sort of attention turned to XML. And so there was a lot of work done to create extensions to JavaScript that were known as E4X to embed, to enhance JavaScript to support XML. And so a lot of work went into that. It was never it was never widely implemented. It was never widely used. And then about, by, by sort of mid-decade, about 2005, um, again, people started thinking about, we really need to start improving the JavaScript standard again. We need to make it a more powerful language. And um, so another attempt was made to define the next version of ECMAScript, ES4. Uh, and uh, that, that attempt also failed. I'll talk some more about why that failed, but it didn't work out. And so 10 years later, in 2009, there was a release called ES5. Um, it was originally called ES3.1, but before it finally shipped, it was changed to ES5. But the 3.1 designation, you know, you can kind of set the scale for what sort of release it was, how complex it was. It was just some minor additions to what was already there in ECMAScript 3. So, so the world, you know, this is kind of the timeline 
of the development of ECMAScript standards is you got, the initial, you got the initial standardization, then kind of work went off into this black hole that really didn't, didn't uh, accomplish a lot. Uh, but then about oh, six, seven, eight years ago, serious work got back on track to work for the next major edition of, of ECMAScript, which became ECMAScript 6. Now there was some good ideas, some interesting stuff that was developed during this during this black hole period, and some of that went in and informed what in, was in ES6. But, but really, the majority of work for ES6 started in about, in, uh, well, really 2009, and has happened since then. Now, it's probably good that we didn't create, that the original ES4 or the second ES4 didn't actually get standardized because the world wasn't ready for it and people really didn't understand how people use JavaScript in the browser back in those times. So if you can remember back in this, this, this initial period up here, this period up here, well that's the period when sort of web 2.0 Ajax was being developed. It's also the same period when like X, uh, XHTML was what was the hot thing, and so you can kind of see why there was a parallel before between ES, uh, E4X and that. So it's, um, it, if we'd done a standard then, it probably wouldn't be what we wanted to have now. The other really important thing that happened before we really, stuff seriously started going for ES6 is what I call the JavaScript performance revolution, right? We, we figured out how to make JavaScript fast how to make it run fast. And, and that was what says, well, now that it's fast, now, now we really need to think about how to make it a more powerful, more comprehensive language. So, so, so basically, ES6 or ES2015 is really the first comprehensive revision since 1999 of JavaScript. And uh, you get a sense over here of kind of the relative sizes of these various versions of the spec is, uh, uh, ES 2015 spec is over twice the size of the ES5 spec, so there's a lot, a lot of work went into it. Uh, what you see up here on top is the, the ES 2015 spec, underneath is the ES5 spec, so you get a sense of, of that. And um, so today, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to talk very much at all at all the new features that are that's in ECMAScript 2015. Um, there is plenty of places on the web where you can read about those. There's lots of good tutorials. Um, I encourage you to, to go and read those. You need to learn about it. But, that, but I'm not going to talk about, it, about them today in any detail. But you can get up here. There's a, there's a lot in there you can see. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of material that went, went into it. Um, so I wanted, what I did want to talk about a bit is how it's developed. Okay, and so we talked about TC39 and how it works. And people have various ideas of how standards are developed and stuff. And different standards are developed in different ways. But I want to be clear that w one of the misconceptions is it looks something like what we have up here in the left. It's this big formal process with hundreds of delegates sitting there debating issues and it's, it's not that at all. Some people think it's more on the right, you know, a smoke-filled room with people uh, playing poker with each other and trying to outbid each other to who gets their way. It's not that either. Um, this is really what a TC39 meeting looks like. Um, there is a typical meeting these days, there's maybe about 25 people attend, those people, the members of TC39 are actually organizations and the people there are representing those organizations and these are, are some of the organizations that are members of TC39. It's all the major browser, browser manufacturers, a number of the major, uh, major web property uh, uh, vendors, uh, some smaller companies, some people representing some frameworks, some, some academics. Uh, and this is really, if you can think about this, 
this is the design committee for JavaScript. This is the set of people who gets together and decides, okay, here's what JavaScript is, here's what it's going to become, okay? And, uh, you know, th these are the sorts of things, yeah, particularly for ECMAScript 2015 that we, we wanted to focus on, right? We scaling it up as a language. It was modularity, better abstraction capabilities, just a more powerful modern programming language. Now, two specific things we thought about that's, uh, uh, well, two things that come up there. One of which was in doing ES 2015, um, it was becoming clear that JavaScript was going to be the only language that was deeply embedded in the web platform, which meant if anybody wants to implement another language, it was probably going to be compiling to JavaScript. So we looked quite a bit at what was needed to better support other languages that are compiling to JavaScript. And overriding all of this, we looked at what are things that only TC39 could do? Because there are many things in, in kind of extending the JavaScript environment that somebody can just do in a library. You build a library and takes care of it. Well, if it's something you can do in a library using the languages that exist, TC39 doesn't necessarily have to do it, do anything with it. But if it requires deep extensions to the semantics of the statements of the JavaScript language, then that's something we have to do and nobody else can do. And, uh, you know, just like just like the, the world of the web, in TC39, we argue about questions like, what kind of language is JavaScript? Is it a, is it a functional language? Is it an object-oriented language? If it's an object-oriented, is it class-based? Is it prototype-based? Pro, pro, yeah, prototype uh, it should it be a permissive language? Should it be a secure language? We gotta, you know, these are all issues that we look at and we try to find kind of appropriate positions to guide the language forward. And, and in doing that, you know, you can think about what we're doing here. I mean, we have this language. People know what JavaScript is, right? And we want to make it a better language. But we kind of have to respect the language that's there. You can't, you know, you, well, you can't create, you don't want to create something like this picture. And JavaScript is never going to be ML, it's never going to be Fortran, it's, it's never going, going to be Python, it's never going to be Smalltalk, it's never going to be Lisp, it's, it's, it's never going to be anybody else's favorite language. It is what it is. And so we kind of have to re try to find and respect what is the spirit of, of JavaScript and as we extend it, how do we do it in a way that makes it feel natural for JavaScript. So we don't want to create monstrosities like this. But as we add things, what, what, one of the things that's unique about language design that makes it really hard is that everything is interconnected to everything else. So every feature you add potentially interacts with every other feature. And so, you know, it's pretty easy to sketch out an idea for a new statement and says, well, this statement is going to do X, Y, and Z. But then you have to look at what happens when you butt that statement up against every other statement in the language and every other feature, how do they interact? And so that's, that's sort of analysis. That's where lots of the time goes in working through a language design like this. Another thing with, with JavaScript, you know, we just got a lot of baggage. You know, a lot of, and a lot of it goes back to those 10 days in May. You know, there were lots of things that were done in a short period of time and which made sense in, a, in, in the context of the time um, which formed the flavor of the language. Like, for example, the original version of JavaScript didn't have any exception handling. So lots of things in JavaScript where you might expect an error, instead you get the value of undefined or some automatic conversion or something happens. The reason that was was there was no way to report an error, okay? But that's part of the baggage we have to live with. And we can't, we, we can't get rid of that baggage we can't, uh, we can't fix it because somebody out there, probably millions of websites out there, for any little feature in the language that you'd like to, to make better, somebody is probably using it on a website. 
And we don't want to break your website or your website or your, your website, anybody's website. That's really probably, this is the number one mantra of TC39 is don't, don't break the web. So we want to make it a much better language and we don't want to break the web. So I want to give you here just kind of a quick rundown through an example of one of the sorts of, one of the problems we had and how we, how we look at doing this. So here's, here's a piece of JavaScript code and it's showing an example of what some people call the closure and loop problem. And what we have up here is a loop where the variable v is iterating over the, the keys in an object x. And so each time through this loop, p is going to have a different value. And there's also this variable v declared inside the body of the for loop. And all it does is collects callback functions. Uh, and within those callback functions, there's a reference to v and p. Now, a lot of people code stuff like this and then run their program, they find it breaks. And the reason is, is they almost surely expect for each of these callbacks they capture, they expect V and P to be the values they had in the iteration of the loop where they captured the callback function. But in fact, when they run it, they find down here at the end where they run all the callbacks, V and P for all the callbacks have the same value and it's the value of the last value that V and P had when the loop was executed. And the reason for that is, uh, is what's called variable hoisting in, in JavaScript. When we say var P up here in the for and var, var V down here in the body, that, it's like that var really didn't exist there and instead up at the very top of the function there were var declarations and these are simply assignments to that outer scope variable, right? So there's only one instance of these variables P and V, which is referenced by every callback, and its value is the last value they had, right? So that's, that's a bug everybody has tripped over probably who's done this sort of uh, created callbacks like this. And we, that was, this is one of the things we wanted to fix in ES6. We wanted, you know, the people not create so many bugs like this. So, um, so how do we do that? Um, it would be nice if we could just redefine var so that instead of var being hoisted up to the top of the function, it just created a, like what happened in C, that it would create a variable that was local to the loop body and wasn't visible any, anywhere else. But we can't do that because, um, because code exists out in the web where a variable v is declared within a block, but then after the block, somebody references it. And that's in, from the beginnings of ECMAScript, that's perfectly valid code. So we can't break, we can't, we can't change that, right? That would be breaking the web if we did that. So what we can do, what we did do, is we said, okay, we can introduce, we can't change what var means, but we can introduce a new kind of declaration. Right, so that's why we introduced the let declaration. And the difference between var and let is that lets don't hoist to the top of the function body. Instead, uh, lets, lets are local to the block in which they're declared, and a let in the head of a for loop is local to the, the body of, of, the, of the for loop. So simply by changing these vars to lets in ES6, now this code will do what the programmer originally wanted. Okay, so now, so, we're, now, so now we've introduced this new type of declaration, right, let. So what are the implications of that? Um, you know, if we go back and look at var, there's lots of other strange scoping things in traditional JavaScript, like, you know, did you know that you can have two parameters with the same name? and that those names can be the same as the name of a var, and you, right, and you can declare a var multiple times, and you can even have a function name with the same name here, x, and you go down here and get this call, well, what are you actually going to call here? Are you going to call this function? Turns out, no, you don't call this function. What you're going to call is probably either this value of x or that value of x, or gee, maybe if actually if if obj here is has no prop, oh, if it's null or undefined, then this loop won't execute at all. 
in which case the value of x is going to be the value of the second parameter named x, and that's what you're going to call down here. Um, so these are all a pretty, pretty legitimate WTFs about JavaScript. Okay, so in, in adding let, we want to get rid of those, right? So you go through some of the things you could imagine that could come up with let. Like what if you say, you know, you have two lets for the same name. What if you have a let and a var for the same name? What if you have a, a parameter named x and a let named x? What if you have a function named x and a, and a, a let named x? You know, what, what if you have a, a var that gets hoisted up to the same level of an outer x? You know, these are all things that could have strange and bizarre semantics if we, if we let it to them. But they're probably all errors. And so what we say is there are static errors. Okay, so, so, so in, in designing it, we, we make, make it an error. So, um, so there's a whole set of rules we kind of came up with for dealing with these declarations. And so, you know, so this is probably just working through all this let stuff is about six months work, you know, uh, just to do that part. But, so what, we, but what we've done here, in effect, we've taken part of our luggage and we put some legs on it and made something useful out of it, all right? So, so that's how standards advance. So, <laughs> so, so to kind of wind down here a bit, I'm going to say, so what's next? So, um, we got Equiscript 2015. Uh, it took about 15 years. <laughs> uh, is, uh, so does that mean we can expect that the next version will be Equiscript 2030 and it will be about 11 or 1,200 pages, you know, it's, that's kind of the growth rate. Um, no, hopefully not. That's, uh, we don't want that to happen. Because uh, while, while it was good, in some ways it was good that the ECMAScript had time to bake before we got to 2015, it also creates lots of problems and stuff. Uh, so, well actually what we're doing going forward now for ECMAScript, we're gonna have a train release model. And that's actually why we refer to this as ES 2015 as opposed to ES 6. So every June, there's going to be a update to the ECMAScript spec. Uh, and these updates were probably are going to be incremental. They're going to be small for the most part. Occasionally, there'll be some big features roll in. But there's going to be sort of continual improvement rather than just waiting for one huge big bang release. And if you go to the TC39 GitHub site, You'll see there's a process we now have for uh, feature development that we go through for each feature, and those features move through stages. And basically, w when a feature gets down here to stage four, it then goes on the next train to leave the station. Okay, and some features can go through this process in a matter of weeks. Other features will take multiple years to go through this process, but it, it's really we're trying to get to this continual development cycle for, for the ECMAScript specification going forward. So, to kind of wrap it up here, the ES 2015, it's, it really is finally done. It, it's out there. It's, mo many people are already using it, primarily using transpilers, in particular Babel. So, there's nothing stopping you from using it today. Um, it's really been rapidly uh, implemented in browsers. All the major browsers, you, the, you can go online and you can find a compatibility chart that says who's implemented what, but, but all the browsers are, I think, now over having 50% of it implemented and some are closer to 80 plus. So I think over the next couple of years, you'll see full implementation in all the browsers. And, uh, it really is, you know, I think this is going to be the foundation for JavaScript for the next 10 or 15 years. We're going to, these, we're going to have these incremental releases or building upon what ES6 is. So for, for your future as a, as, as a front end developer doing JavaScript, you really are going to want to learn ES6 and, and all its features. And that's, you know, that's going to be the future. So, uh, I mean, yeah. So that's basically it. Uh, so these slides, you can get them off my website. I'm you know, happy to answer questions or anything. Follow me on Twitter, email me, and uh, enjoy ES6. It's been a long journey. Thank you. Thank you.